Good evening, everyone. My name is Sean Wilson. I'm the Artistic Director of the Ottawa International Writers' Festival, and I'm broadcasting from the unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. I'm so thrilled to welcome you all to our 2021 fall season and tonight's conversation between Rhonda Douglas and Katharina Vermette. I want to begin by thanking you all for supporting authors and booksellers through these difficult times. Our official bookseller is Perfect Books on Elgin Street, and I know that wherever you are right now, there's an independent bookseller nearby who would be more than happy to sell you some great books. I also want to thank the Ottawa Public Library, the Government of Canada, the Government of Ontario, the City of Ottawa, the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, Carleton University, and CBC for their ongoing support. We've got lots of great events coming up. I hope you'll join oh, us again tomorrow as we <laughs> welcome Kamal Al Soleil um, thank you. on Friday. <laughs> really nice the podcast. I just, I just oh. can't talk. Oh, sorry, we're we're live now. Uh, can't so talk. I hope you'll join us again tomorrow as we welcome Kamal Al Soleil right. on Friday. The podcast right. will feature poets Evan Jay and Max Porter, and next week we have Essie Dugin, Peter Mansbridge, and Mark Critch. So there's lots to look forward to. The festival is supported by generous individuals like you, so I hope you'll consider subscribing to our newsletter and making a donation to support our ongoing programming and children's literacy initiatives. We can't do this without you. Our host tonight is poet, editor, and author Rhonda Douglas. In addition to her books of short stories and poetry, Rhonda is also writing a mem is also a writing mentor with amazing resources to share, and her day job also makes the world a better place. She works to empower informal workers through an organization called Women in Informal Employment globalizing and organizing. Please give a warm virtual welcome to our wonderful and talented host tonight, Rhonda Douglas. Okay. <laughs> great. Well, we'll start. If we're live, we'll start. That sounds great. <laughs> uh, I'm so excited to be here, Katharina Vermette, and we are going to talk about her brand new, like brand spanking new. This is Pub Day, right? Is this publication day? Okay. Yay. Pub Day. Happy publication day. So this is The Strangers and uh, really, really excited uh, to have a chance to talk to you about it because um, it's such a powerful book. So let me just do, um, do the intro. Um, so Katharina Vermette is a Red River Métis writer from Treaty One territory, heart of the Métis nation, um, and lives with her family next to the temperamental Red River. She's worked in poetry, novels, children's lit films, and she was born in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Her father's roots run deep in St. Boniface, St. Norbert, and beyond, and her mother's side is Mennonite from the Altona and Rosenfield area, Treaty One. So you probably know if you've joined us today that uh, Katharina received the Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry for her first book, North End Love Songs, The Muses Company. And The Break won several awards, including the Amazon.ca First Novel Award and was a bestseller in Canada. And her National Film Board documentary, This River, won the Canadian Screen Award for Best Short. She holds a Master's of Fine Arts from the University of British Columbia. So The Strangers is just out now from Hamish Hamilton. It's the follow-up to her award-winning debut novel, The Break, and includes or follows the story of previous characters set in the same world. So let's chat about it. Let's let's get into it. So tell us why you still were held in that world of the break and, and wanted to just keep going and do a little more with Phoenix's story in particular. Like what was it that you felt like you had left unexplored there? Um, well, so much. And and first, I always like to preface this part of saying like the book is a standalone. Where the these are up, like I'm trying to operate, and I hope I've successfully operated. For everything is a standalone, so that you don't need to necessarily read the break. It's not a sequel, in any conventional sense of the world. It's very interconnected. I'm obviously a fantasy nerd. I like interconnected spaces with lots and lots of characters. Even though I write in realism, it's very much not a fantasy book. Um, but I think, I mean, the, the, the technical part of that, the, the technical answer of that is that originally I had written for my MFA at UBC, I had written a short story collection and several of those stories, probably about four or five of them, um, ended up being the novel, The Break. I ended up developing them further because again, they were all interconnected into this same world. Um, but one, group of them really surrounded and, and became the break and it felt very tip of the iceberg for this world that i had imagined 
imagined at that point. Imagined. Um, it was only a dream. It was a dream to have a novel. So I just kind of worked on one novel and thought, wow, I could actually do that. That's great. Um, but then I was, there was so much of this world that I had left unexplored and so many characters that I just couldn't pick up. The narrative of the break is so claustrophobic and um, I couldn't pick up several of the other characters because it just didn't work. So this gave me the opportunity to do that. I really wanted to explore family and this this broad functional, dysfunctional Métis family. And I really could do that through um, through the stranger. So Phoenix is the only main character from the previous book that comes through. And then we pick up with her sister who's briefly mentioned in the break and in the original incarnation of the short story collection, Cedar, Cedar Sage had her own chapter, which ends up being the first chapter of Cedar Sage's um, storyline in this novel. Um, and, and I got to pick up the other characters and just really like broaden those family connections and relations and yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a lot and I hope it works and <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Definitely. Well, yeah. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, and like in the break, like Winnipeg is still for me anyway, a character in this one too. Right. So, yeah. um, do, is that, is that conscious, something conscious that you're doing? Like, were you trying, is, is that something you, you set out to do is have Winnipeg be so, I don't know, so central in how it, you know, how the characters, uh, move and are in their world basically. Yeah. I think it was conscious. I mean, conscious, unconscious, I'm really deeply invested in character and the idea of, um, interior lives, exterior lives, and just like, I'm drawn to characters as a reader, and I'm, I'm in love with characters as a writer. Um, so, so it, when people refer to Winnipeg as its own character, because I think definitely it is. And I think setting done right is its own character. It is a place because the land we are being on <laughs> is so much a part of our lives. And we know this deeply, those of us who are from Winnipeg, because we, we know this from like the weather is its own beast that always is surrounding us in one way or another. Um, you know, and the the landscape is is brutal in its way. You know, the the cityscape is is I'm I'm talking like the cityscape and the peoplescape can be <laughs> peoplescape. That's totally a word. Um, can be brutal at times. Like there's so much of a presence, and it has such a character. And and I do love it. I do love it. I like to, um, it's home. It's family. So I do get to interrogate it, and you know you know, give it shit every now and then, but I do love Winnipeg deeply. Um, and particularly talking about a Métis family and Métis people, this is our homeland. This is our place that we have belonged to for so many generations. So in that, that's why I love, like Winnipeg is a family member here. Um, this place, place and, and the knowledge that we have of all these neighborhoods and places and rivers and trees, um, this is deeply connected to who we are as, as people, as a culture and also as individuals. So yeah, I do really, I do really love Winnipeg. I do really like writing about it. I don't think it's been written of enough. I get excited when I hear about Winnipeg stories because I think there's so many stories and I think we come from a really fascinating place that we should, you know, well, we can, we can appreciate it. We can also give it shit. I think, I think both are equally allowed. I'm sorry, I keep saying that. I love that idea that sort of, um, you know, I guess like loving interrogation, right? The way you would in a family, you can interrogate a place, which, you know, I think, yeah, that's great. Um, so I'd love to talk a little bit about the relationships because, um, gosh. <laughs> so first of all, when I when I when I first I'm, I was reading the PDF version, my my physical version has finally arrived. Yay today! So I was reading the PDF and I opened it and I was like, oh wow, there's a, a family tree here. And so I'd love to hear about why you did that, because the structure of the novel is so well, like it's five years, but it's so so well woven, right? Like it's it's sort of, you didn't need it for clarity in my mind anyway. So why, why the, the family trees, um, graphic at the beginning, which, which I loved, but, and, 
and I did go back to it, but yeah. <laughs> Just well, I like that it was clear without it, because I remember um, folks reading the break always kept referring back to, I also had a family tree in the beginning of the break, and people kept referring back to it because, you know, I had so many characters that it was hard to keep track of where everybody was, right? Um, so I'm glad this one is a little more clear. I tried to be a lot cleaner. I tried to learn from the mistakes of the, of the previous, like, this is what we do as novelists, right? We keep trying to learn from what we do into the next so i tried to be a little cleaner and a little more organized with this family but it's still a big big family um i love well the short answer to that is i love genealogy i'm a kind of kind of obsessed with genealogy maybe even i think i i secretly my opinion is that most if not all that's a stereotype but most if not all Métis people are obsessed with genealogy because we've been so well documented um and that is actually and so we all have these genealogies and when you go and get get your Métis card you have to go to the St. Boniface Historical Society and you have to get your genealogy and it's a wonderful process of validation because you can get these huge like I ordered the expensive book that just talked about all my ancestors from you know they went back I think 15 generations or something it was just a bunch of names it was beautiful and glorious um and of course those are all the French names and then you know there's a couple insertions of of the indigenous folks and some of them have baptismal names and some of them are just you know named kind of Marie Assiniboine or whatever but it's a beautiful process of of naming and having these connections to people you know I love um I love having that. I love that gift. It's kind of, you know, it's kind of a, a weird gift because the reason we were so well documented was because the church wanted to keep tabs on us and because, you know, eventually they stole all our land and, you know, all of these things happen. But I kind of, so that part is kind of frustrating, but I also love the idea of reclaiming this knowledge and saying, thank you, colonizers. Now we're going to use this to create nationhood and community and 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 cultural connections so I loved getting my I, I've been very lucky I've always known my my people I've always known these stories um, through my family but I loved getting those genealogies and, and figuring out who I'm connected to and figuring out that actually several of my friends are distantly related to me you know those are those are really great so that's the that that I really love genealogies and I I might always include a genealogy um, I'm, I'm saying that trying to figure out how I'm going to put them in all the next novels that I'm writing, <laughs> but I, I do love it. And when, when I wanted to create this family, that's the first thing I saw is I saw how they intertwined on these, um, in these lines and in these spaces and how, how they were, you know, just a couple lines apart, you know, it's kind of how they look, how they were connected in that spatial place as well as how they were connected through through life. Um, yeah, so. I love that. I just yeah. love, no, I love that. I love it. Here, to, yeah. here, here, genealogy. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'd, I'd love if to talk about some of the characters. So, um, gosh, um, let's start with Margaret and Annie, uh, who felt to me like, I don't know, sides of a coin maybe, um, you know, where mm -hmm. Margaret felt, kind of um, like her dominant feeling, I would say, was sort of resentful, I'm going to say, maybe even angry. And then with Annie, it just felt like love and acceptance and a tiny little bit of occasional passive aggressiveness, you know, like just, um, <laughs> but, and then of course their relationships. So are, are, is, do you think of them as being on like this continuum or on a range? or a, you know one offsetting the other in some way i think they definitely offset each other um i think they definitely that's a really good estimation because they're kind of opposites in a lot of ways and i think margaret really learned from her mother annie was always such a gentle person who never spoke up in a lot of ways so margaret then learned her le the lesson margaret took away from that is i'm never gonna you know not stand up for myself and margaret always sees the fight and she's definitely resentful she's definitely ragey um probably too ragey um i really saw not 
not only them as that, I, I also saw the connections between the, the next, because Elsie, who's who's Margaret's daughter, is very gentle like Annie. And and then Phoenix, who's Elsie's daughter, is very angry like Margaret. And I think part of that is what they learned from each other and kind of they took, it's like every generation like kind of undid the work of the previous and tried to get a little bit better um, or a little bit worse, you know. Um, but yeah, definitely those kind of pairings. I felt like, you know, um, Cedar is the other daughter of Elsie and, and she was a, a gentle person like Elsie was. And, but she was also super, super smart like Margaret was, you know, and um, yeah, I kind of saw them in, in that way that they were kind of like each other. And then of course not like each other, but then all like each other in different ways and kind of like they all had the same ingredients, but they had like, you know, different, you know, it was different ways of putting things. They came out different. <laughs> yeah. For so many reasons. Yeah. And I, I hesitate to say this in case my mom is watching, but there's a lot in here about mother daughter relationships, right. And how complicated they can sometimes be. And so, uh, talk to us a little bit about that and, and, and what goes on in the novel with these, um, yeah, these mother daughter relationships and the, the, the bonds and the strain on the bonds between them. Well, that's, um, where do I start with this? I'm really attracted to what I call the mama drama. I'm fascinated by this relationship, both as a daughter and also as a mother to daughters. I think it's, um, it's that kind of thing that's supposed to be the most important relationship, right? But it can also be the most antagonizing and the most um, at odds. I think so often that um, learning how to love each other and how to like what best to do for one another is so difficult. Um, the in this way, the the line starts with Annie, who is very um, elderly in the book. Um, and so she comes from the generation where she just did as much as she could for her family. And that was her world. Um, Margaret, her daughter was a, a bit more of a, I guess you would say she was a boomer age, kind of boomer, boomer age, boomer age person. Um, and she had different lessons also where she really wanted to be strong and she really wanted to set herself apart and kind of, she didn't want her family to be her center of her life letter. But of course, um, the irony of her life is that it definitely was, and her family was very much the center of her life. Um, and then there was Elsie, who's a little closer to my age, kind of like, what do we call that? Gen X, Gen Z? I don't know what do we call them. I don't know what letter I'm at anymore. Um, but <laughs> but she um, she's definitely struggles. And again, I think part of her journey really started of trying to set herself apart from her mother because she didn't want to be angry like her mother. She had to have something different. She really was drawn to her grandmother and that gentleness. But of course at that phase, um, and there's also interventions in Margaret's life, but I, at the most notable intervention in this life is that in Elsie's children are taken away. So not only is um, her children, um, her parenting is denied. So as much as she wants to parent her children, she is not able to. Um, and really that's kind of the beginning of the story, you know, as much as we talk about all these pasts and all these deep connections, because that's what family is. The beginning of the story is really these ch children not being connected to their family, not being connected to their mother. Their mother is, is taken from them or they're taken from their mother, but they're denied. And it's about how like they're still like their family. They're still very much connected with their family as much as they are out in the world, in some cases, very much alone and, and let down over and over again. Um, so in that they're also doing the same thing that the previous generations have doing, and they're trying to learn those lessons and trying to not be like their mom, but kind of be like their mom, like we all are, right? You know, it's like, I want, yeah, yeah. a little bit of this, a little bit of that way. Yeah, totally. Um, so the, the story, uh, the story starts with, uh, this story starts with Phoenix's story. And, um, I was, it, it, I guess all throughout, there's this thread of, um, 
this thread of not being looked at or like really not being seen that is like symptomatic of racism right like it's just it's mm -hmm. it's just a some great denial right um and so to what extent does that shape what happens to the women in this story i think that <laughs> shapes <laughs> i love these big questions it's like hmm, how does impact racism impact you know everybody um, I think it does. I think it shapes them that very deeply. I think that had they been mainstream people, they would have had very different outcomes. Um, I think that it really shapes their responses to the world, not necessarily who they are at their core, of course, because who we are at our core is, is, is very different. It's very pure, but I think how they are responded to shapes their world how El like elsie's children are taken away because she's indigenous you can talk about any other way of like maybe she could have done this and maybe she could have done that but the reality is that indigenous families are subject to greater scrutiny than non-indigenous families and they are broken up more often but not at phenomenal rates than non-indigenous families so really does i think the biggest sever in this family line and the biggest tragedy is that her her children were taken away and and everything's after that for phoenix and cedar sage um is a result is impacted by that there there is no way that that is that is not a break that can be mended that is something that is now burden of the children to um figure out how to live without their, their families so i think i mean yeah, and I, I think um, there there's so many ways, and I love that picking up that idea of seen and not being seen. I also always relate to, um, in my own life and, and then in my characters' lives, is often this um, silencing, you know, this idea of how we silence ourselves, you know, how we're not seen and then we just don't speak up, how we don't feel the impact that our words might have because we doubt that because we've given been given no validation that speaking up is going to make a difference so we just remain quiet um so in that way um and if i think that all of these women do that same thing where they silence themselves and they're oppressing themselves because they've been so oppressed in the outside world um and they're constantly doubting each other, themselves and that i think is is the saddest part um because they're their power has been taken away so readily and they they expect it. Um, and and that's another thread that weaves. And maybe that that's the universal thing that they all have in common and they've all reacted to in the same way. They really, really just kind of stopped. Whether they keep fighting, like they're fierce and tough and violent and problematic like Phoenix and Margaret, or they're gentle and loving and, you know, um, that troubled like Elsie and, and Cedar, um, they've all silenced themselves because um, they don't understand that they will, they could be heard because they've been heard. Yeah, and there's definitely, you know, throughout the novel, the kind of just the, the system, right? Like how, represented mm -hmm. sometimes by social workers, sometimes by the prison, sometimes, you know, just the system that is unrelenting um and it it was there in in the break as well but can you just speak to that a little bit particularly for i think well i guess you know i'm like trying to single out in particular but there's no in particular to it <laughs> like everybody had to deal with it you know so yeah i find it really difficult i have means but i am no means an expert I have experience, but I am no means um, the most experienced in these systems. Um, and it's funny because I was doing an interview earlier today, and my the question was like, "What kind of research you've done for this?" And and honestly, my research is pretty slack. It's been kind of like just living my life and experiencing what I've experienced in and around the justice system. Not yet. 
um, not yet anyway, um, but also like in and around child welfare, in and around, um, you know, social workers and intervention, in and around like, you know, courts and people who I know who have been affected by that in one way. Um, these systems are, are readily present in so many lives. And um, I also, you know, come from families where we have lots of social workers and lots of teachers. Um, and, uh, you know, just lot, I used to work in um, social services. So I did work in, in justice kind of, you know, in su supports. Um, one of my many jobs before I got to be a full-time writer. Um, so I do like part of that is deliberate in our in our vocations, but also those vocations were chosen because many of us have had interventions like that in our lives, whether it be deliberate, tragically. Um, so many people have ha been taken away from their homes. So many people have had their children at risk of being taken away. Um, this it's been for me uh, in my life. I feel like I've always been a adjacent to that. I've always been aware of that surveillance is present, um, which is a really weird way to parent. And I'm really realizing now I have two older daughters um, and I have two young babies and young babies now as an older middle-aged person who, you know, homeowner and all this stuff, you know, my, my, my husband's a guidance counselor. Um, so I very, I'm very set, you know, but when I had my younger daughter or my older daughters, I was, um, I was a single parent. I was living in housing. I was a, I was a student for mo much of their lives. Um, and their dad was still around, of course, but, um, I was very much in that group. Um, so I didn't realize how much my good parenting and how much my children were always clean and they always had the good lunch with all the food groups in there. I didn't know how much of that was really performative, you know, how much of that was really being completely aware that, you know, I had good, not, on, not only out of want, but also out of like, you know, I, I knew such and such got there you know got CFS called because their kid had like bruises because their kid was a rough and tumble kid you know so and so had their kid I heard a story once of, of a kid getting um, CFS called based because they lost their mitts and they didn't have enough like you know winter wear which in Winnipeg is a big deal um, but the teacher called CFS on that um, so those stories really you know they get in there and then you make sure your kid has their mitts and then you make sure like all of this stuff happens and it's it's so normalized and it's so internalized that i didn't even realize until now i'm in this different setting that i'm still doing that you know my my baby just um nursery school started preschool and i'm already like you know feeling doing that that performative like she has to be clean and she has to be this and and god forbid in the age of COVID that she has a sniffle you know i'm, I'm mortified if she's like you know sent home or whatever you know like it it's it's so strange to me and i'm just beginning to unpack those those feelings of fear and and i cannot say that i've been deeply affected by this i cannot i know so many so many tra tragic and sad stories that um, are not mine and that I've only, you know, hopefully held space and, um, to hear. Um, but it's, it's still, it, it affects us in so many bizarre ways. Um, and I hope I've answered your question. I'm not really sure. Oh yeah. Systems. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I do. You know, they're, they're absolutely everywhere and they uh, infect our lives in so many ways, even small ways, like how it's, yeah. Wow. Um, gosh, <laughs> I was trying to think of where to go. The The scene that came to mind from the novel when you were talking about that was less with the social workers and, and um, more with when Cedar Sage um, ends up living with her dad and her new stepmom, Nikki, and she gets sat down to check for lice, like out of nowhere. Thank you very much. Hello. Welcome to my house. Let me check you for lice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but Nikki, Nikki was a really interesting character um, because she was so, um, I don't know, so complex in her narcissism, <laughs> right? Um, just so great. Um, I mean, I love them all, but uh, oh, so good. 
Um, I wanted to ask if when you thought about the ending, like when you started the novel, did you, did you know where the ending was going to go? And I don't want to give the ending away, but like w that thing of like, will I have an ending that moves up? Will I have an ending that's, you know, goes down like mm, <laughs> hope versus not, um, hope. What were you yeah. thinking when you started? Yeah. a lot of places that it went. I very much, um, my, my process for writing this, I wanted to write it a lot cleaner because every, like my, my, my first, my first novel, it was just a mess. It was a mess from start to finish. It was a mess for years. So this one, I wanted to be so very clean, right? Um, so I wrote each character one after the other. So I wrote all of Phoenix's parts, all of Cedar's parts, all of Elsie's parts, all of Margaret's parts. And then I thought of how I would weave them together because so much of their lives were sep are separated. Um, and then in the weaving, I kind of like, you know, changed something so that they would be a little more interconnected at times. Um, but it really kind of started and like it, part of that disconnection is, is the plot, you know, part, part of that disconnection and hopefully connection is the most important. It's, it's the love story that kind of flows through, um, the will they or won't they, for lack of a better <laughs> anything. Um, and then I actually ended up going back and I, and I changed most of Cedars and I changed almost all of Margaret's and I kind of moved everything around and, and kind of mixed it up again. So I did have my messy moments for sure, but it was so much cleaner um, a process and I'm so grateful for that. Um, I was really surprised. There were a few things that really surprised me. You know, I didn't, um, there were, particularly in the relationship between Elsie and Margaret because it's such a contentious relationship. So I didn't realize um, it would quite end the way it did. Um, I found a lot more peace, particularly in the interweaving of all of their stories. I found, uh, you know, more places of solace and, and, and kind of opportunities of love and hope and, um, which are always my favorite things to find. Um, I, I was writing this so, so much of this I was writing, um, during last year, during lockdown. Um, so it was, there was this inevitable isolation that kind of like was kind of brought into it, that disconnect. Um, I actually changed the last year of, of the book. So there's, it's five years and the last part of year five, I, I changed that to be, um, in COVID, you know, it, it's kind of in, and all of those like, um, symbols of, you know, glass and videos and masks and things really just kind of added to the that sense of distance between everyone so i really use that um and i'm disappointed that i had to use that i i i i'm you know as a as a reader as a as a tv i find that i really enjoy shows better that don't COVID at all you know and the ones that do i kind of get like you know kind of annoyed at the fact that we have to deal with this and I don't want to deal with it in my entertainment world. Um, so I felt like COVID felt like such an obstruction to everything. And so I was annoyed at everything. And, you know, at, at one point I think Elsie's like fighting with her mask and I'm like, yes, that's me and COVID um, just fighting with each other as we all are um, for many reasons. Um, yeah. So it's really, there was a lot of like surprises along the way. I did have, I knew where I was going and I stayed there, but I, I think it was definitely better than when I started to me anyway. <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I, um, there were moments I would say about two thirds of the way through the book. I was like, Oh, she better not. Like I, if this goes where it might, I can't cope. I can't cope. I was so, <laughs> This, this, it's such a moving book. It's so moving. I'm like, if you're watching this, you need to go buy the book. Could you just buy the book? You need to have the book. It's glorious. <laughs> it's glorious. Um, and, um, yeah. So I wanted to ask you about, um, your, you know, you're a, you're a poet. Um, and in fact, a first, 
people first knew you as a poet, novelist, fil now you're in film. So, so you're a storyteller, but a poet. This is definitely like you, it, particularly I think in Elsie's story, like just the, um, you, you see some, there's some poetry form in there for, for me anyway. So mm -hmm. how do you, um, is it all story to you? And you just, um, you know, work with the form, or or do you think about it? Do you are you trying to work with poetry within the novel? Are you trying to bring, you know, I, I don't know. I just I wanted to ask you about yeah how you think about poetry novels storytelling, kind of in one diagram. Big ball of <laughs> yeah one yeah. yeah it's it's not a in any sense it's just a messy ball of like okay. everything together in some way <laughs> uh, and and that's really that that's the process for me um i do think of myself as a poet first i think i i am drawn through poetry into story um my very um like mentioning that short story collection in the mfa it was very much basically just really bad poetry and bad stories because it was like long short stories, long poems, um, I kind of feel like I let, I let the form tell me what it is. I kind of, when I have an idea for something, I, I let it tell me what it needs to be. And I, I mean, as a, as a poet, you understand poetry feels very loud to me. When a poem wants to be a poem, it is a poem and there is nothing else it can be. It is a poem. Um, and poems are, um, I feel like they're songs. Um, I feel like they're loud and musical like that. They have a cadence, they have a rhythm. They are, um, yeah, loud, bossy things. Um, stories are a little more gentle in a way. I, I often feel like when I'm writing from my own voice, it ends up being poetry. That's what I end up doing. My poetry tends to be a little more autobiographical than anything else I do. Um, but when I'm writing in different voices, when I'm imagining different characters, when I'm bringing in my friends, as I call them, you know, all these friends that live in my head that I make up for my own amusement and understanding, um, then it becomes a story, you know, and, and every voice is is different. Um, Elsie was definitely a poetic voice. Elsie was definitely someone whose narrative often descends into, um, oh, what is the word? There, there's a rhythm to, to how she speaks and how she understands. She's very, um, she's very sad, first of all, and um, something that I have <laughs> very, that's my, a lot of my poetry comes from sadness and comes from grief and comes from trying to understand why and give voice and sometimes just narratives and stories to why. Um, so Elsie was very much that same compulsion of, of poetry, whereas Cedar is, well, first of all, she's the only first person narrative. The other ones are, are thirds, very close thirds, but, um, but thirds. So my eye, my eye, my first persons are always the truth tellers. They're always the ones who are, we're just in their head. We're hanging around, rattling up in there. Um, and there's no room for them to lie to us, um, because we're right up in there with them. Whereas the other, like a close third, you can still hide things, you know, and I, I'm really, fascinated by unreliable narrators and I'm basically like I think we're all unreliable narrators but I really like with that idea of what is truth and what is maybe just a story that this character is telling telling us the truth um so I trust no one um that's the other part but yeah and and I I, I do like that I, and I love playing with those different ideas of voices I think they all very much have a different written voice um, but it is all poetry. It's nothing I do. And even film is definitely poetry. My graphic novels, I wrote those all, all first as poetry um, and then made them into panels. Um, it all comes from that same source and then kind of changes after that. Um, but I think it's all poetry. Yeah. Mm, I love that. I, I feel like there's... Um the the piece i was thinking of when i when i say like you when you know you're reading a novel read by a poet is like 
these these moments so there's the formal thing which is sort of the rhythms of elsie as she's speaking and how that's represented on the page and the language but there's also like this these moments of tender true insight where like as a reader you're like yep that's it that is what it's like to be human and the book is just full of those and so i think that's that's also part of it is um is which is not to say that doesn't happen in narrative like what am i saying um lots of novels are like that but i i feel like there's something there's something there um anyway let me move on um i wanted to ask you about this is silly but i loved um food in the book so and part of this was watching uh in like in foster care when food is used as just in cedar's cedar sage's story where her access to food and good food and fun food and control over her own food was you know was was important because it was people were using it as control um but then also the delight of food and, you know, Margaret at the end making what Annie used to make the, do I, am I saying it right? Pan cruche, which sounds delicious. So yeah. Um, it's, it's, bread. it's just deep fried bread. <laughs> like you, yeah. it's hard to go wrong with deep fried bread really, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, there is no wrong in deep fried bread. It's just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Love that novel as well. I'm always surprised what people think. Yeah, I, I think I was I was really hungry when I wrote everything. Um, the Pencrus was actually a story that my auntie had told me um, that my my grandma used to to make my um, and she actually my auntie had called me and told me the whole recipe and the whole process. Um, so that was definitely and that was of course that was um, her conversation with me was at first a poem. Um, that I ended up putting into the book because it was too beautiful to pass up just this like idea of fry bread. Um, and it's, it's, it's fry bread. We're talking like there's lard and there's beefings into this, like it is fried bread. Um, and probably so, so heavy, um, in that incarnation. I've, I've made variations of fry bread. I don't think they're nearly as good. I don't remember my grandma's fry bread. Um, but, um, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, it just sounds very heavy, um, but I love that. Yeah, definitely, um, maybe I was just so hungry because I did love that contrast of when Cedar Sage goes to her dad's house and suddenly discovers this deep freeze full of pizza pops. And that's totally something also from my life when, um, when I was a teenager and my dad um, moved to a bungalow with a rec room. Um, and I just remember being fascinated by this space and this deep freeze. And I had a stepmother who um, just was all into food and all about making these big meals like every day. Um, and it was just completely foreign to me how we could, you know, and it was fascinating too, you know, how we could have so much food and not that I was in any way deprived, um, but it's, it's just that richness is very striking, um, particularly when it's contrasted with scarcity and, and, and denial of that and like restrictions on food. Um, yeah, I wonder about that. Cause it's also like, I guess too, if I'm thinking of food now, I had this, um, <laughs> with Phoenix cause Phoenix is incarcerated. So her access to food is very limited. And I, I have this one scene and for some reason I'm like, it's one of those things that just stick where um, her her counselor, Ben, gives her this Nanaimo bar. And I, ha I got to indulge in this paragraph of my very real and very true feelings of Nanaimo bars, which are basically just like the bottom part. The best part is just there for fun. Um, yes, like a pig and a half of eating the Nanaimo bar it was glorious. It was great. <laughs> Okay. It's only about the bottom, you know. I don't know about I don't know about this Nanaimo bar thing. I think it should just be Nanaimo bar bottom from here on out. <laughs> it was so good. And then also the you know Annie and Margaret, um, they make the pan cruche very differently in ways that are just very evocative of who they are as women and how they how they are in the world and how they are with their families. So yeah. 
It's interesting yeah. too. Um, yeah. Okay. And, and also, you go ahead. Oh, I was also just going to say with the and Krush because um, that was something Margaret had and she wasn't able to pass it on to Elsie or Elsie didn't take that up. And that was one of those things, um, those very real food things, um, which are, again, it's a very small thing, but it's those are the things that are lost. You know, Elsie didn't have it and didn't know how to make this or had never made it. Um, she was not able to parent her children. She didn't want to her children. So as much as this pancruche was something I really indulged in these descriptions, I don't remember my grandmother. She died when I, when I was younger. Um, and, and that was something that I only got to reconnect with as, a, as an adult. I mean, and so often these recipes, these food you know, these little bits of culture are lost in those very, very, very easy ways. Um, so in that way, the pancreas is actually kind of making me sad. But. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you think that there's more story here for you, like with Cedar Sage and Faith and even just further with Phoenix or like, do you feel done with this or is there still more? Um, well, the idea when I um, decided to continue on, the idea was always three books. Um, so the next one, so the, the break was kind of like the Traverse family and the break, or the strangers was the stranger family. And then the third book is, and there's other characters that are in the break that work, you know, kind of throughout the strangers. Um, because we are in an interconnected world and we are in a community where people pass each other. Um, so I really, the, the next book, yes. <laughs> Wait, my answer is yes. Um, because the next book is really um, kind of, it's more aligned with the sequel and there's, there's, there's just more characters, um, like all the characters kind of coming together and other ones. Um, it's, again, I always feel like these sequels they're, they're their own things, they're their own worlds, um, but it is reconnecting with several of the characters, um, not all of the characters, um, because there's another kind of situation that happens. Um, so that, that's what I'm writing now. I'm very late to writing it, but I'm, I'm getting there. Um, and I feel like, again, I know where the story is going and I feel like that's the end. There's certain, but, but I think it's like a certain character ending um, because, you know, I got a lot of friends here in my head, you know, and I think certain characters um, kind of come and go, you know, and I feel like I've built this um, interested world and I, you know, I'm kind of feeding off this gi giant, <laughs> probably way too big genealogy and there's different characters that I can pick up and I kind of see some of their stories um but I it's definitely not everybody and it's definitely not kind of it would be con a conventional you know grouping from one from A to B to C um because I think of them just as stories in whole separate worlds but I'm just using characters that are also connected to the other worlds if that makes sense so yeah, y yes and no. Some of them are definitely ending, um, and and definitely over. I, I, I kind of feel like I know now better, know better now, um, when I'm done with it or when a character is put, put down is the wrong way, put to rest. No, they're not. Well, <laughs> sometimes they just leave you. Um, and, and sometimes they just stick around and bother you for 20 years, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's good news. That's great. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um, I wanted to ask you about the trigger warning at the front of the book. Um, was that, that was your idea or the publishers? Cause it certainly it reads, reads like the author's voice, like your voice. Um, yeah, it's my why did, you, why did you want to include that? Um, I have some folks who really appreciate trigger warnings. Um, and that's how, <laughs> that's how a friend of mine, um, said it to me when, uh, 
when I had put the trigger warning in the break, they're like, I appreciate trigger warnings. So that's how I always think of it. Um, and some people are take it or leave it with trigger warnings and that's totally fine. If you don't need it, don't read it. But, but I also recognize that I'm bringing up heavy things. And as much as I try to be very gentle with what I'm talking about, um, and I try not to, I don't like to dive into the tragedy as much as, you know, I like to, I love my strong characters and I feel like they keep me and them as themselves. It's all kind of void, void, void. You know, we're bouncing on the water. We're not, we're not, we're not diving in deep. We're kind of floating and it's, um, and we're keeping our head above water and, and they're doing that, uh, um, for me as much as doing that for for them and for readers so i do i do like to provide a trigger warning um additional trigger warnings i find they're very this very abrupt um and not very descriptive i found it for especially for this one and i did the same in the break um it's an opportunity just to kind of give direction you know i don't like to give a lot of direction with with writing, I don't think we need to preamble things. Um, I think as writers, uh, we often like, you know, want to explain everything so people will get it right. I, I don't, I, you know, you can take whatever you want and leave whatever you don't. Um, but I give that trigger warning as just kind of like a, an, an initial introduction of what my intention are. And, and is particularly when we bring up these things, because if you are someone who has had interventions from child welfare in injustice in one way or another these are um um these are big things that could um, if you're not prepared to do them can are prepared to read them can do harm and the last thing i ever want to do for anyone is to cause harm um i really believe in these stories and i believe they're worthy of attention I only write stories that I believe are mine and very close to my heart for, for many, many reasons in my own life. Um, I do not want to cause anyone pain by reading them. So. Yeah, thank you. I also, um, you know, the way you wrote this one um, just felt really um, like the, the content, but also, and here's a thought on the content, you know, like don't, um, some, as you say, some direction as to how to take it, which I thought was great. Um, so maybe just to close, uh, in terms of time, uh, would you be willing to read a little bit from the strangers to close us out? Does that sound like a plan? I can read a little bit. Um, great. I can read a little bit. I can do that. That's I can do. I'm going to read. Okay, I'm just going to show everybody the cover. This is the advanced reading copy, so it's not exactly what it looks like. But I also want to show everybody the cover because this piece of art is beadwork, floral beadwork. Sorry, I'm going opposite here, so my fingers like going in circles. Um, this floral beadwork on birch bark, and it's this beautiful, beautiful piece um, by my dear friend Casey Adams. Um, who gave permission for her work and to be used on the cover and it's a gorgeous thing. Um, it has this beautiful like old school 70s paperback font too. Like the whole thing honestly made me cry. Um, and I'm so happy and proud of, of that. Um, so buy the book for the artwork um, because it's a beautiful piece that I am going to convince her one day to let me give her a lot of money to have it. <laughs> one day <laughs> so i'm gonna read the first bit from the first chapter of margaret margaret um is the matriarch um of sorts uh she has an elderly mother um she is the mother of elsie who is in turn the mother of phoenix and cedar sage uh, those four are the main characters and the only thing to know about this because it's her first chapter is that it takes place in 1999 and it's when her first granddaughter is born on the day phoenix was born margaret was working on a new puzzle the phone rang in the late morning and margaret picked up the receiver and pulled the long cord to the table so she could keep working on it 
It was her brother, Toby, who told her the baby was born. Margaret knew it was coming, but didn't think it would be quite like this. It's already? Was it quick? She caught herself, suddenly anxious. Don't think so. Mom went into the hospital yesterday. She told me to call you. Oh, Margaret replied, understanding. They knew to call her before it was all over and done. You're a grandma, Toby said stupidly, and then coughed out his too long inhale of a cigarette. Oh, Margaret said again, quieter this time, then shook the feeling out of her head and lit, lit, lit her own long menthol slim. She exhaled before she went to speak again, then thought better of it another drag instead. You should go see her, Toby choked. You should go, Margot, go. She'd love to see you. I doubt that, she said, not sure who he meant, but either way it was the right answer. She ignored the horrible nickname. No sense getting into that this morning. She looked down at the puzzle. It was 5,000 pieces in a basket, golden retrievers in a straw basket with a big golden sun in the background. So every shade of you go. It taken her all morning just to do one edge. I'm going to go down there in a bit. You should come, her brother turned, like it was something to celebrate, like a girl that young could even be a good mother or be ready to be a good mother. Bring Joey and Alex. Uncle Joey and Uncle Alex. Toby let out another rusty laugh followed by a throaty cough. The boys are in school. Margaret butted out her smoke and thought about it like lighting another one, but stopped herself. She hated chain smoke. And I'm busy today. I gotta start cooking dinner for Sasha in a bit. She heard Toby's disappointment in his phlegmy side. I'll go tomorrow, I will, she said quick, to avert any more of his stupid guilt trip. Okay, okay, that's good, Margogo, that's good. Toby gave one of his soft, annoying chuckles. Can you believe she's a mom? Seems like only yesterday she was... I was pushing her around on that swing in the backyard. Remember how she loved that swing? Margaret scoffed. Toby'd been getting like this for a while now. Sentimental. They said it happened when you started to lose. Toby'd been losing it for years, if he ever had it to begin with. Of course I remember Toby. It's a wonder he's still up. Dad put that thing up in the 50s. You could have killed the child with those old chains. Nah, Dad knew what he was doing. That thing's still as solid to this day. They can put the baby on it. Toby was nothing if not hopeful and dim-witted. Hopeful and dim-witted were usually one and the same. Well, I don't know about that, Margaret picked up another smoke, then a slight change of subject. The porch, too. Still straight as an arrow, isn't it? Isn't that something, hey? Remember when Dad and us built that thing? That was such a hot summer. Hmm, was all Margaret replied. All she had to reply. She knew Toby didn't need her to say anything. He only wanted someone to listen, and no one ever listened to Toby except their mother, who was obviously busy today with the new baby and all. He seemed to be getting even slower with age and liked to talk more and more or had less and less friends. Lately, he called Margaret nearly every day just to chat. It was so irritating as she always had something to do. Between him and Sasha and the boys, always on her about something and always wanting to talk her ear off, Margaret never got a moment's peace. Dad sure how to build things, hey? Margaret made another dismissive sound. She wasn't in the mood for Toby's precious rewrites of the hood. Listen, Tobe, I gotta get to my ironing. It wasn't a complete lie. Okay, okay, little sis, just thought you'd want to know. You know, Grandma. She could hear him smiling over the phone. It was so grating. She heard him light another cigarette and cough into her ear before sputtering a talk to her later. Uh-huh, uh-huh, bye. She rammed the phone down to say anything else and then focused back on all those shades of yellow. So great. Thank you so much for reading that. So uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Um, we are with Katharina Vermette, who is the author of The Strangers, which has been long listed for the Giller Prize, Scotiabank Giller Prize here in Canada, and is in your bookstore today.
today. So you can get it today. Do you want to hold up the cover again? Because it's just so pretty. Ooh, can't wait. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Heather. <laughs> Thank you. It's been